want to get rolling right away with uh, two presenters. Um, I believe Dr. Tim Gates is with us from Michigan State University, and he has had a, a, a long period of helping MDOT with, with research, uh, over 20 years of research experience himself. And, and what he is focused on for us today is something called the dynamic feedback signs, speed feedback signs. And this is a, an innovation coming out of Michigan. Alonzo and he have worked on that is being presented nationwide. This went to TRB this year. So there's a lot of states that are picking up on this, but if you're a, a designer here at MDOT or uh, would like to know more about this, I think this is an innovation that you could improve uh, the safety of our roadways on. So I'd like to turn things over to, to Tim to tell you a little bit about speed feedback signs. Great, thank you, Michael. And so like Michael said, I'm gonna present on speed feedback signs. Uh, Mostly the findings of our research project that kicked off in 2018. Uh, Alonzo was the, uh, the uh, research manager on that project and uh, concluded about two years ago, um, right around December, January, uh, January of 2022, I believe. So it'll be almost two years uh, here uh, as we turn the calendar to the next year. So what I'm going to talk about is the the uh, methods, a little bit on the methods, and but mostly on the findings of our research study. And then I'm going to turn it over to Alonzo to talk about how those findings were implemented uh, into MDOT's uh, new um, guidelines for use of, of feedback signs on exit ramp. So I do want to make clear that this study um, is going to focus strictly on, this study strictly focused on the use of the feedback signs at freeway exit ramps. Obviously, we know that there are uh, all sorts of uh, utilization uh, implementation of uh, feedback signs, but I'll uh, I'll go through that part really quickly. But just to give you a bit of the background, the motivation for this project, um, ramp curves we know are a a uh, very problematic location because there's that high speed uh, to low speed um, change that has to occur. So drivers are coming in at a high rate of speed off the freeway and they have to slow down very quickly uh, to in order to negotiate that curve. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with curves in your in your districts, or your regions where you have these sorts of problems um, off freeway ramps. Um, I can think of one that <laughs> their very first site was uh, Business 69, the loop ramp, that uh, loop ramp to get on westbound um, 69 uh, on the north side of Lansing and Meridian Township. Um, that was our first one. I mean, you can see skid marks out there. They don't even, I don't think MDOT has replaced the, the chevrons in a while in that in the middle section there where they were getting hit all the time. So we're all aware of these. Sometimes they're truck rollover problems as well on the ramps, but this particular project was, was largely focused on ramps. Um, speed feedback signs have been tested out in other curve applications. In fact, Shauna Hallmark from Iowa State about 10 to 15 years ago did a big study nationwide looking at feedback signs on rural highway curves and the safety performance impacts, but nobody had really studied them on exit ramps. So exit loop ramps was, was our, our big focus here. Um, speed feedback signs, as you know, come in all sorts of shapes, sizes, colors. Um, they're used in municipal applications for like school zones or just general municipal applications. Those are the most common. Um, they are used in work zone applications sometimes as well, where they're mounted on a trailer, and we often refer to them as speed feedback trailers. Uh, they typically, they range from 12 to 8, 18 inches. The ones for highway use are either going to be a 15 to 18 inch um, panel, like a character height panel. Um, those are the ones that we actually uh, investigated in this study were either 15 inches or 18 inches. Uh, they oftentimes have this large prominent border. The one you'd be most familiar with would be the one from Traffic Calm, which has been around from about, for about 30 years. The one here that I'm circling, this says your speed. There's a radar that's embedded in the sign that obviously detects the uh, speeds and distances of oncoming motorists. Um, that radar is typically uh, the ones that we've tested out, the Traffic Calm signs, we found that it usually will pick up a passenger car between about 250 and about 500 feet upstream. Uh, trucks, obviously, because of the larger size, the larger target for that radar um, tends to pick them up at 600 feet uh, or more even um, in advance. Uh, some vehicles, they do have a little bit of a challenge picking up. Um, we found like Chevy Equinoxes, for whatever reason, the shape and the configuration of the front, the radar wouldn't pick them up quite as well. Uh, they do have this little strobing beacon here you can see as well. 
Um, the FHWA restricts the use of strobing. They call these, these are actually technically changeable message signs or DMSs, dynamic message signs. Uh, and so the FHWA had issued a memo about 15 years ago saying that you can't really, you can't strobe or flash um, these signs, same as you can't strobe or flash a DMS. So we recommend for MDOT, and we see it all the time for municipal purposes and we can't control that, but MDOT not use that strobe or flash that's, that's built in there. Um, these do have the ability to, in addition to showing the, the digits, also can display a message, a text message like slow down or too fast. And that message can be alternated with the speed digits. And so MDOT, when we started this project, they had a draft special provision out there that suggested when uh, to just show the speed digits. But if the person was exceeding the advisory speed for the ramp by at least 10 miles per hour, that you alternate it with uh, the, the speed digits with the text message, the slowdown message, to kind of provide an extra bit of conspicuity. We found, as you'll see, that that was actually quite effective, and so we do continue to recommend that uh, that as well. Um, some signs like this one over here on the left, this was the test sign. It actually, you can have the, uh, the speed digits and a text message as well. Just to give you a bit of a, a view here of what one of these looks like in practice, this was as a part of our test study. You can see how it's alternating here. This is northbound 127 at Round Lake Road. We'll show it again. Okay. So like I said, prior safety research had investigated the use of speed feedback signs either on rural highway curves, just standard two lane highway curves, or freeway main lines. You can see this big operation here at the bottom right, freeway main lines. Uh, but there had been no research, no prior research at exit ramp curves. Um, they have been found to be effective uh, in, in many of these applications. You can see on the two lane highway curves, Shauna Hallmark at Iowa State found a one to two mile per hour reduction in curve entry speeds. The freeway main lines, I think we found two studies there, uh, two applications where they found a two to five mile per hour reduction in curve entry speeds. Now, obviously that sort of a setup on the main line here in the bottom right is a much more substantial type of sign uh compared to our standard small little uh, feedback signs here now i will say in terms of cost these cost as far as the signs themselves and the batteries were about a four to five thousand uh, dollar purchase about four years ago uh from carrier and gable so they're not very expensive at all now granted the the mounting and the solar hookup and all that stuff costs too but they're a fairly low cost treatment so we when we started this study, we, we uh, had an idea of the types of things that we wanted to evaluate. And this list here gives all the various nuances and characteristics of what we uh, looked at uh, with respect to these feedback signs. So we looked at the longitudinal positioning, the effects of the longitudinal positioning, be it the distance upstream of the start of the ramp curve, the lateral positioning. So we looked at the traditional right side mount versus a left side or gore area mount. Uh, in case, you know, if there was guardrail or there, there's really no place on the right side, that traditional mounting location, if you just didn't have space to do it, we looked at the messaging strategy. Uh, so looking at just speed digits alone versus speed digits alternating with the slowdown message. Um, we looked at the effects of the sign activation range. So if it activated like for drivers when they were right at the sign or if it activated uh, when they were further upstream, you know, looked at that effects on drivers. Uh, the panel dimensions, we compared the 15 inch versus the 18 inch. And then we also compared an alternative sign here that we had a much more narrower radar band uh, from Advanced Traffic Solutions. Uh, one of the ideas here with these traffic calm signs have a 30 degree cone, uh, radar cone, and it tends to pick up mainline traffic. And so we were concerned about that. But as you'll see, as we get through this presentation, the concerns with it picking up mainline traffic are really not a problem. There is no effect of these signs on mainline traffic. We measured mainline speeds with and without the, the uh, panel turning on, and there was no impact to mainline speed. So you can you know, calm your fears there. Even if it comes on for the mainline, that's okay because the, we found that it actually had a benefit for ramp traffic. If it turned on a bit earlier because of a mainline truck going by, so what? It caused the ramp traffic to slow down actually, and that's what we want. Um, so here we, we picked six uh, locations. You can see the six study sites here where we implemented these. It was a mix of system interchanges and service interchanges. Uh, all except one had a speed differential of either seven uh, of, of ranging from uh, 45 miles per hour to uh, 50 miles per hour. <clears throat> um, so, you know, ramp high speed uh, mainline and then ramps that were between 
a 20 to 30 mile per hour advisory speed. Uh, here's the one I mentioned earlier, the, uh, uh, the you can actually see it right here at the top and uh, north, northeastern Meridian Township here where we had that button hook from um, Business 69 to get onto I-69 West. That was actually our first test location. Uh, talk a little bit about the uh, LiDAR speed tracking method that we utilize. So we originally started out with using cameras to try to track speeds, but we decided that a better method was to use this LiDAR tracking method that many of you are familiar with if you worked with us on research projects where we have an upstream data collector person and a downstream data collection person. And they basically just are using a police LiDAR gun to lock onto the vehicle and track them from far upstream all the way through into the curve. And so you can see the raw vehicle trajectories. We get a raw, we get a speed measurement and distance measurement three times per second. That's connected to a laptop computer. So we get this nice, pretty raw vehicle trajectories that basically allows us to create an infinite number of spot speeds. So we interpolate the data and you can see the, the process spot speeds at 50 foot increments here at the bottom. So we can look at, of course, the average of those, the 85th percentile, the 15th percentile, et cetera. So let's jump into the findings. So the first, remember I mentioned we talked about uh, looking at in longitudinal position with respect to the start of the curve. And what we found here was that um, the, the sign is more effective. The conclusion here is that the sign is more effective uh, the closer it's positioned to the curve. Um, drivers, um, there, there's, there's information out there that says if you give the driver the message too soon that it'll cause problems. And so, or that they'll they'll disregard the message. So we want to get that message when it's needed. Uh, so putting this feedback sign at the point of curvature uh, is is preferred, like we have shown here um, at the top right. Uh, the, in terms of lateral position, the signs were equally effective if we had it in the gore area next to the exit sign or on the right side. And I know the Southwest region is already starting to implement some in this Gore area here because they just don't have space to put it. Maybe there's a bridge pier or something like that where you have the, the loop after the uh, bridge. And so they did a, a, a Gore area mount. You can see the messaging strategy here. We found the most effective messaging strategy. And you can see the if the bars are shifted more to the left here, that means it had a stronger speed reduction effect. So alternating the slowdown message with the speed digits, like you can see here at the top right, was the most effective. Uh, message activation range here, you can see um, that the uh, that the uh, we want to have the most the, the greatest effectiveness was found if the message was activating between 250 and 400 feet. Uh, when the vehicle was between 250 and 400 feet upstream, there was really no additional benefit for a further upstream activation, but there was definitely a, a loss in the effectiveness if that message activated when the vehicle was too close. So we want to make sure that the message is activating when the vehicle is at least 250 feet mm -hmm. upstream of the sign. Uh, yeah, upstream of the sign. Uh, so looking at the effect of faster drivers versus slower drivers, we also split... Uh, split up the drivers into uh, slow, medium, and fast uh, drivers. And you can see that the sign had the greatest effects on uh, faster drivers, which is a good thing. In terms of long-term effectiveness, so all of these were short-term uh, studies where we had MDOT's crews put the sign out there and we tested. Uh, the long-term effectiveness, you can see that over the first 14 months of a sign that was implemented at uh, I-96 to I-69 interchange, that there was no loss in effectiveness over time. So that's a good thing. So this for, first 14 months that this sign was out there, we saw that the uh, that the effects were about the same, about a two to three mile per hour reduction in speeds at the curve entry point. Like I said earlier, no effect on mainline vehicles, which is a good thing. So even though that thing might be activating for mainline trucks or other large vehicles, it's no problem. In terms of conclusions, uh, I'm going to skip right through these and have uh, Alonzo go ahead and uh, and give his presentation on how we package this all up into the specs. Um, I do want to mention that we do have candidate uh, a list of candidate ramps for uh, installation. We did some network screening of crashes. Uh, I do know that the South, that Steve Brink in Southwest has already started to implement those that are on from his region that are on this list, and so that's a good thing. And we'll be evaluating those as part of a phase two study on this project. Um, but yeah, so we have in the report, we have the list of candidate sites that we've already screened out for MDOT. So I'll turn on, turn it over to Alonzo now, and he can talk about the how everything was packaged into MDOT's guidelines. Morning. 
Uh, I just want to talk about the guidelines that came out from this research project. So these are the proposed uh, guidelines that we're going to submit next month to EOC for approval. Uh, the draft been already reviewed by all the regions and uh, I believe we have some pretty good guidelines that we can use from this research project. So first is a uh, general criteria. The use of pit feedback sign is not an not a short condition or should condition. Uh, the application of flashing beacons or integral LEDs with signs may be considered on case or by case basis for a, a specific regulatory warning signs. Uh, site selection recommendations. The sites include those with frequent lane, deploy, lane departure, posted ramp advisors less than 35 miles per hour, average speed at per PC ramp advisory design speed plus 10 miles per hour, the ramp AADT more than 1000. Signs can be installed on the roadside within 250 feet of the curve. Clear line of sign along the roadside for at least 600 feet upstream. Uh, the, some other recommendations in the guidelines is longitudinal position and lateral position. Uh, the sign recommendations, sign characteristics, full metrics, amber LED feedback display capable of displaying characters that are minimum of 15 inches in height. Activation range and radar performance ensure that the feedback panel activate for approaching vehicles a minimum of 200 feet in advance of the curve. PC. Um, type of message that we can have for a speed at least at or below the advisory a speed 10 miles per hour, just display the measure speed. For a speed exceeding more than 10 miles per hour, just display the message and slow down. No maximum speed cap is necessary. Set a minimum speed threshold of 15 miles per hour to prevent activation from brain or small objects. Do not flash the display or utilize a strobe beacon as the MUTC prohibit the use of flashing displays for DMS. We have the main paper as a reference and three papers that were written from this research. Also, I want to mention for installation and maintenance, if the region install one of these one, they are responsible for the maintenance. The Lansing Central Office is not responsible for that. It's up to each region to maintain them. So make sure that uh, if you decide to install one of them, you have the funding to maintain them. And is there any questions? Well, I think I have one minute. Otherwise, thanks. Alonso. That's it. thanks. Yeah, I appreciate you, Alonzo and Tim, your presentation on speed feedback signs. It's uh, good to, to learn a little bit more about that innovation here. We do have a question and answer um, application here within Teams Live that you can put in questions for Alonzo or for Tim, and both of them will be here for a little bit to answer them. I think Alonzo's sticking around. I didn't yes. see any questions coming in yet. Yeah, well, Alonzo, and thank you. Sorry so, to interrupt here, Michael, but yes, there, yes. the Q&A does not seem to be functioning quite normally right now this morning. Okay. It's very, okay. very slow and very <laughs> okay. laggy. Uh, hopefully it will uh, teams will function as it should and if you all in the audience there are typing questions uh, we should be able to get a report of it I'm not seeing anything either uh, and we might have to follow up with uh, questions if teams does start to play nice and gives us if it gives us a report if there are questions being asked but at this point uh, yeah I, I I was out there making that announcement you feel free to use this Q&A and boom nine just popped through uh, <laughs> And it oh, looks okay. like it's the same for five or six. They were trying to get it through. To, it, it's not working very well, but there are a few questions out there now. OK, um, I guess the the questions, if you could go ahead and read those to us, uh, Heidi, I'm I'm not seeing them quite yet. Um, we could give a little chance here for at least one of the questions to be answered by um, Alonzo. 
Um, I'm also not seeing them on my end either. Okay. So yeah, you might get them. All right. Yeah, once they come uh, so through, these, we can answer them. I've, I've got them here. So will these uh, be ITS devices or added to traffic signal inventory? Can you repeat the question? Will these be ITS devices or will they be part of the signal uh, traffic signal inventory? Right now, they belong to the signal inventory. That's the agreement right now. And uh, these guidelines will be under the signal web page. They were developed by us in signing, but they belong to Signal. That being the agreement by upper management. Uh, if we got time, was the preferred time this? Uh, was there a preferred time the speed was displayed and the slowdown uh, was displayed? Uh, maybe Tim can answer that question. Yeah. yeah so I think what you're saying, like, what's the alternating um, frequency or this the the cycle? Um, we recommend that it be a one uh, one hertz, so one time per second. So display the the speed digits for a second, display the slowdown message for a second. Nice conspicuity from that. It's not flashing, so it's okay, but it's it's uh it gives more eye catching um, effect. And it does seem there's one more since we're in it. Uh, were the signs used MASH compliant, M A S H compliant? No, they are NCHRP 350 compliance. There are at this time there are no much compliance that made that M dot is aware of. Alrighty, that was it. Great, thanks, John. I appreciate you reading those and getting that QA up and running for us. Uh, continue to feed the QA questions to us. We'll be fielding those as we move along. I want to thank uh, Tim and Alonzo. Alonzo, uh, our traffic and safety safety section. Um, signing manager for the uh, presentation they give if, if you have any locations on ramps you're thinking about uh, doing some upgrades construction you just know there's a lot of run off the road going on there think about this innovation and, and bring it into effect now that we've got some guidelines coming through from alonzo and how to put them in and, so and like next that, yes can i make one last pitch too if you're implementing these anytime soon we have that follow-up project where we'd be happy to do before and after evaluations of the speed reduction effects so Great. put that pitch out there. Contact myself or Ron Alonzo on that. Thanks, Michael. Okay. Yeah, yeah we're, we're still doing the second phase right now. So good.